Welcome to Geek Out Virtual Con, the replay of our special two-day live streaming event, April 11th through 12th, 2020. In this segment, we have two special guests, Athena Finger, heiress to the Dark Knight, and Rick Stafford, the true Aquaman. He really does swim with sharks. Tune in and be sure to hit the follow button. I appreciate everyone tuning in today. Thank you for spending the day with me. You are all awesome. Keep creating comics. And we're going to get out of the way because there's a huge, amazing guest coming up next. A friend of mine who I get to see all the time. So I might just stay in the background being quiet, just watching. So I'm going to get out of your hair. Matthew, take it away. Thanks so much, Rob. Hey, gentlemen, thanks so much for joining us. <clears throat> I really, really appreciate it. I enjoyed uh, the segment here. And I am bringing on Miss Athena Finger. And hello, Miss Finger. I, Hi. <laughs> uh, Meredith, I believe, is going to be joining us. Rob's kind of hanging in the background for now. And I'm serious here, ma'am. This is an honor. Um, I can't begin to tell you how much of a fan I am of your grandfather's. Um, oh, thank you. I knew uh, the story long before Batman and Bill. I cheered when you guys won the lawsuit. And every time I see it come <laughs> up, when his name is on the, the big screen, it, it reminds me of my Star Wars moment. When you hear that music of Star Wars, I get that, that proud feeling for you guys. And for our audience that doesn't know, shame on them. They should take their geek badge away. But those that, <laughs> those that don't know who Bill Finger is, explain who he is and, and how you are related to him, please. Sure. Um, Bill Finger was uncredited for 76 years as being the co-creator of Batman. Um, we won a case with, against DC Warner Brothers back in 2015 to get his name attached to the byline for Batman, finally. Yay! So, um, unfortunately, um, back in the day, a lot of these collaborators didn't get credit. So, um, Bob Kane went to DC, um, which was National Comics back in the day, um, and signed a contract saying that he was the only person that was doing Batman and came up with the character. And um, so that's the only name that we saw for so long. And um, Bill was really in the background. He was the writer, but he um, he was visionary. He was the one that actually came up with the look. Um, Bob Kane's original concept doesn't look like the Batman that we have. Um, Bob Kane's original concept, he was in bright red unitard with you know little black panties and a domino mask and little blonde wispy hair and big stiff wings be behind him and he was swinging from a rope well that's not really bat like so when he collaborated with my grandfather which they had already been working together on some of bob kane's other strips that he had um he you know, played with the word bat, said that he needed to be darker, he needed to have something that kind of represented the bat, so he recommended the cowl with the ears, and instead of the big stiff wings, he came up with the cape with the scallop, so that when he was leaping, it would kind of, you know, flare up behind him, kind of giving the impression of wings. Um, you know, he came up with the backstory for Batman, he came up with Gotham City and Gordon, and so many of the villains that we love, um, Penguin, Riddler, he collaborated with the Joker, he wrote the first Joker story, um, Clayface, Mad Hatter, Catwoman, he um, came up with Robin because it was really hard for him to do all this writing for Batman and he didn't have anyone to talk to. Um, you know, in the 30s and the 40s, if you were talking to yourself, you were crazy. So okay. they didn't have all this inner dialogue. So he needed someone to talk to. So Robin came into the picture. And so a lot of what we know about Batman came from Bill. And um, he wasn't credited and he was kind of unknown for a long time. But, you know, we changed all of that. <laughs> and, yeah. Now, which movie was it where Bill Finger's name first appears? Which one is it? That was in um, Batman versus Superman, Dawn of Justice. Okay, that's what I was thinking, but I just didn't want to misspeak. <laughs> and his uh, name will be attached to every other one. He even got credit in Birds of Prey in that long list of people it. that they gave credit to. 
um, the Joker, they gave um, credit to all three, Bob Kane, Bill Finger, and Jerry Robinson, which was really nice, because Jerry Robinson was super important back in the day. Yeah. He was the original ghost artist for Bob Kane. Um, a lot of people don't know that Bob Kane only worked on the comic for a very short time. Um, and he wasn't very talented with his artwork. Um, you know, Jerry would say that he had to correct a lot of what Bob Kane did um, to make it look good, make it flow better, um, just fix the art in general. Uh, so Jerry was very important for the first couple of years. So it was really nice to see his name attached in the credit also for that movie, so. Yeah. yeah. And you know, you brought up the point right at the beginning about how many of the, the creators back in the day had a, you know, they signed away their work or they signed away the rights to their work. And, you know, so many had to go through lawsuits to, to even get back a piece of it. Uh, but few or arguably, if any, are as important to the entire genre as Bill Finger. I mean, you laid it all out for the audience on how important he was to the Batman mythos. And, you know, when, yeah. you know, when I say <laughs> I'm a fan, you know, there's the Joker right there. Nice. You know? That's so, amazing. <laughs> you, my, wife, my wife drew it. And then uh, I, I had an artist uh, nearby that, that inked it up for me. But I'm a huge Batman fan. And, but Bill, you know, he did. He, he gave us the, the whole look of Batman. He gave us the, the, the really the, the, the whole foundation for this, you know, almost a hundred years now of yeah. Batman, <laughs> you know, and, and I've been a fan, you know, not almost a hundred years, but about half that time. And, <laughs> yeah. You look very young for a hundred. <laughs> right? You're pretty bad for 25, right? You know, that's yeah. what <laughs> but, uh, now I'm going to totally butcher when, what year did Bill die in? He died in 74. In 74. And so that was before, you know, Bill Ke or uh, Michael Keaton as as Batman, before really the, the money really started rolling in for the franchise. Because there in the, the late 80s, early 90s, comic books were seeing a lot of money. And, well, they were, because, the, you know, um, Hollywood jumped in and started really making a ton of films in the 90s. I mean, they weren't the greatest films, but I mean, they kind of... <laughs> I think they needed new material. They were kind of running out of ideas, so they turned to the comic book to get some fresh new eyes. Also, I mean, the comic book industry in the 80s um, suffered, and even in the 90s they suffered. So I think that was a way to kind of bring the population back into that medium, also start reading the stories again that they're seeing on the big screen and, and find out where these characters are coming from. Exactly. I mean... I got back into comics, <clears throat> excuse me, in the 90s when they broke Batman's back and they killed off Superman in the same week. And I had a, <laughs> what a yeah, week. <laughs> yeah, it was a horrible week for DC, but uh, a neighbor kid of mine was having a birthday and he was right at that age. And so I was like, well, I'm going to go buy a comic book shop. And so, of course, I had to pick up one each for myself. Suffering from OCD, I ended up going back 15 years of Batman books in not too long of time at all and owned them. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Scouring the shows, going to the sidewalk sales at the shops in, the, in, in Fort Worth. Uh, every weekend back then, you could find some shop that you know had the quarter box and spend you know three hours going through it just to right. find that one that you're missing for your collection. And, and that's it. You know, Batman has just always been a huge part of my life, um, especially the the later half. And I've got a trophy case that is full of, of Batman statues. There's uh, somewhere over there behind me. I'm stuff. Yeah, <laughs> Joker and Harley Quinn. Oh, I see <laughs> but um, you know the when an artist doesn't get their their due, or and it's a shame. But when a writer doesn't get their due, it's well, I don't want to say it's more because it's not. But when you have someone that is a part of both, that you know they're doing the storylines, the backstories, Jim Gordon, I mean, uh, besides Batman, you know, who is more important in Gotham than Jim Gordon? <laughs> you That's know? true. It's true. I agree. Um, you know, unfortunately, it's the way that the industry was run in the early years where, you know, Siegel and Schuster were 
unusual where they had both of their names attached to it. Usually you saw one person's name and it was usually the artist and not the writer. Um, and that was just the way it was done. Um, so unfortunately that's the way they conducted business. But you know, over the years, the fans have been curious about where where these characters came from, which is the most important thing is, you know, where where did all of this you know, culture come from and these right. characters that we love? So, you know, I think with the fans demanding that these people get the recognition has really made the industry change their policies on that and really make sure that people do get recognized for their creations, for their you know, um, con contributions to these storylines, even if they didn't, you know, start with it. So, I mean, it, I think they've really molded the industry to change their policies, which is great. Yeah, I agree. And it was, you know, a, a little late on the upkeep there. But it was never, though. That's the thing is, it's like, when, when we won our case, I felt that it was super important that the history was corrected. We'll be back right after this. Hey guys, how you doing? This is Jake Estrada from Indie Originals. This year, for Indie Originals 2020, we've added another category, and that's comic books, independent comic book creators. That's right, guys, here we are. We're inside a comic book shop, and look at all these beautiful comic books. I want to tell you, indie comics are the backbone of Marvel and DC, because Marvel and DC cherry picks certain, certain creators and they make these guys superstars. So that's why we added comic books. But I'm a comic book guy as well. I'm the creator of Bocas, soon to be released feature film. And we also have Terrence Baker as a, a judge, along with Nino Mazzarina, who does the Unbelievable Launch of Detergent Man, along with his little comic strip that he does for the Chicago Tribune. You need to sign up. You can go to www.indieoriginals.com and sign up for the Indie Originals Combo Contest. And I'm looking forward to seeing you guys. Peace out. When we won our case, I felt that it was super important that the history was corrected, especially for a character like Batman. I mean, Batman's huge. I mean, he's one of the top <laughs> icons that we have in the world, not even just in American culture, but in the world culture. Definitely. So for people to not know the, the real history behind the character um, for so long was an injustice to the fans. So that's, uh, you know, I, that was my ultimate goal was to make sure that the true story of Batman and his history was corrected. Definitely. And if, folks, if you haven't seen it, I believe it's still on Netflix, Batman and Bill, or on Hulu it's One. on Hulu, yes. Hulu. It's a Hulu exclusive. Um, ah, that's right. <laughs> yep. So um, you can, if you don't have Hulu, you can always get the free trial for a week and you can watch you it go. and say goodbye to Hulu if you don't want it. But um, it is out there. Um, you know, I think there's some bootleg copies going around too if you don't want to go that route. <laughs> so, um, no. It's really good though. The, the company that did the documentary, they do fabulous work um they also have done other documentaries that have been you know recognized in a lot of the boards and and all the festivals and things like that so it's really good it's it's heart touching it's um you know as a fan you have a sense of victory at the end also even though it wasn't your family you just feel like a part of it <laughs> right. so it's really good if, if you haven't seen it and how long was the court battle um well, I, see, that's tricky. I, I, you know, my father, when he was still alive, he would try to get Bill's name attached to the Batman title, um, you know, and that was hard. He, he got nowhere with them, and then he passed away in 92, so it kind of fell on me, but when he passed away, I was not even 16 yet, so I couldn't really do anything. I kind of discouraged from pursuing it because my father had such a hard time with it so i mean it really started you know i want to say in the early 80s went through a few years there and then i picked it back up in 2011 12 and in, in that area um i was hesitant to pursue anything 
um, just because of what I've been told for so long that it would never happen and things like that. Um, it was Mark Tyler Nobleman who wrote Bill's biography and, and the documentary is focused around a lot, um, really pushed me and said, you know, you really need to do this. And then once I started exploring what needed to be done, I realized I only had so much time left to even fight this battle. So, you know, with the 75th anniversary and things like that, I knew that I only had a few years left to even pursue this. So I kind of, I kind of pushed towards the end there. And uh, luckily, my sister is an attorney and was able to get the oh. right. Yeah, <laughs> it just, you know, a, a lot of things fell into the proper place for me to get this resolved. So I, I'm very fortunate in that matter and that it, it didn't take a decade for me personally to fight this. Um, it was a matter of a few years, but that doesn't mean it wasn't easy. It, it took right. a lot of people and it took a lot of negotiation and, you know, we came to a resolution that, you know, that we could live with. <laughs> that, that's so important you know it, one getting it resolved getting his name on there but one that the family could at least feel comfortable with and we had a, a question from uh books by bond they want to know who is your favorite batman that is the most asked question <laughs> <laughs> uh, as far as um live action uh michael keen's always been my favorite um you know that he just did a, an amazing job because he did you know a great job with both characters exactly and bruce wayne so and yeah. that's not easy to do no i don't think anyone has done it just a sense um maybe no i don't think so either i think the only one that really came close and people aren't going to like this but i think ben affleck also did an amazing job being able to portray both as an older Batman and an older Bruce Wayne, who was kind of conflicted about what where he wanted to go with his life sure. and how he, you know, really had to struggle with having these two people within the one. Right. So, well, I've been an advocate here lately. I am a, a the firm believer that Michael Keaton should come back and he should be in a live action The Dark Knight Returns. Um, uh, or yeah, the Dark Knight Returns, Frank Miller's, um, okay. and just going that dark, gritty, and you know, doing the the one shot of of him back as Batman because he's of the age now, right? And I think he could still pull it off. But uh, you know what story I would like to see someone attempt is the that? Kingdom Come story. Yeah, no, that would be great. That would be uh, epic. That would. <laughs> And you know, who knows now with us getting this sort of Elseworlds kind of feel going with Joker, which right. I immensely enjoyed. I have seen it too many times already. I saw it twice at the theater because I, I just liked the unique take on it, but I also mm -hmm. like seeing the, the development of that character, but also knowing you know that this is just a version of Joker. And right. I'm, I'm really hoping that we see more of that kind of thing from DC, not so much the mainstream PG stuff that is out to, you know, group the, the, the uh, Justice League together, but right. ones that they come at as the angle of, okay, this is going to be a standalone story. And then, you know, look what happened with Joker. They said they weren't planning on doing any sequels and now we're going to get sequels. And I would, there's just so many good storylines that are already uh, in the bucket, you know, from, almost a hundred years of Batman stories. And so there's no reason to try to reinvent the wheel, especially one thing that'll piss me off is when they get somebody that doesn't know the Batman character. And yeah. when you put a gun in Batman's hand, yes, it goes back into the forties. I know Batman used to carry a gun, but that's not the redefined Batman. You know, Batman has a complete aversion to guns and don't put a, that's what sets him apart from the villains to me is right. doesn't have to have a gun. But you know, when you got cannons on the Batmobile, <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of like, uh, you're stretching my uh, willingness to. Yeah, uh, um, I mean, I know it's such a hot topic with the guns and Batman. I mean, it's part of our culture. We're a gun culture. Um, yeah. So, I mean, it makes sense for him to have those kind of weapons, especially, you know, if he has the means to have, you know, 
Lucius Fox making all these cool gadgets for him behind the mm -hmm. scenes. I mean, now did he have with what our society is like now? I don't think there's anything wrong with it. Um, I just don't think he needs to be gun crazy. Right. Um, it, it's a tool. It's part of his toolbox. So I mean, I know yeah. a lot of people are like, no, you can't have them. No. But again, if you want to keep them relevant and current, that kind of goes with our society and, and the way it is now. And I guess there's, you know, going to be times when you're going to just need to pull that that pistol. Uh, right. I mean, it's not going to be his first tool that he pulls right. out. But I mean, when things now, get he didn't, rough, <laughs> it's nice to have it. Correct me if I'm wrong, though. He didn't have a gun in the beginning. He got that later on, correct? Or did he have one? No, I believe he always had guns because that's what they had. I mean, he was fighting gangsters. Think of what it was going on in 1939 and 1940. I mean, right. Uh, and they were all shooting each other. I mean, that's. Well, I know. I know the old serial that he had a gun. Um, I just wasn't sure if back in the comics that he did, but I think so. Here's a great question from IndyCon. Did Bill have any other original works or characters? Oh, yes, he did. Um, so right after Batman, he collaborated and co-created the Green Lantern and also Wildcat. So he, um, and he wrote for many other titles. He wrote for Superman. He wrote the first Kryptonite story. Um, he wrote for World's Finest, and he wrote for Timely, which is now Marvel, um, a lot of their collaboration stories of characters. Um, so, I mean, he, he was all over the place getting the work where he could. I mean, he was a struggling right. artist that needed money, so right. <laughs> he took the work where he could. But, I mean, he also, he didn't just write for comics. I mean, he was one of the first comic book writers who jumped from the medium and started writing for TV and radio. And he wrote a couple of sci-fi movies in the sixties. So, I mean, he, he really did the full spectrum for his medium. We'll be back right after this break. Cards, the universe and everything is a trading card, card collecting battle card game that has a little something from everything. From the old west to outer space and everything in between, Cards, the universe and everything is great for gamers and collectors of all ages. Download it from your app store and as you collect hundreds of available cards, there are more weekly so you can craft up to 10 decks and battle against your friends and other players from around the world. And if you're an educator, check out CardsTheUniverseAndEverything.com for a special offer for you and your students. Man. And and such a, a great industry to be in at the time as far as having that venue, you know, to, to be able to to have that, that venue to put out the various types of work because he did span a, a wide spectrum there. You know, it, he wasn't just pigeonholed into comic books and he wasn't pigeonholed into just one type of genre. And, no, it's uh, true. Um, you know, I think his friend Charles Sinclair had a lot to do with that because um, he collaborated a lot with Charles. Um, Charles Sinclair is the one that he co-created the Batman episode, The Clock King, with. He uh, did the screenplay for The Green Slime and for um, Track of the Moon Beast and, and various other things. So I think the people mm -hmm. that he surrounded himself with after he got away from Bob Kane is what really helped him branch out into these other aspects of the writing medium. And Heroin Berg wants to know, did you know that, speaking of changes, did you know that the newest version of Bruce Wayne is Chinese? Gotham High Young Adult Novel. No, I had no idea, but it doesn't surprise me. I mean, there's so many different Batman variations now that are out there and have been out there, so. Right. It's like we were talking about the Elseworlds and, you know, you, some of the, I, what I do like is that they're making a lot of those into the animated movies now. Mm -hmm. And I don't like that they're all 20 bucks a pop, but, <laughs> <laughs> but David King had a, a question. Would either one of us like to see a live action Batman Beyond? Are you of familiar course. with this? Yes. That um, is awesome. We you know I was, when I was watching the animated series back in the nineties, and they started advertising for this Batman Beyond character. Now, I never read comics. I wasn't a big comic book reader. 
I was in art school. I was always creating my own art. So I wasn't really big on to like reading comics. I was busy doing other things. So when I saw them advertising, I'm like, what is this? This is weird and different. And then I started watching, I'm like, this is awesome. <laughs> I almost had the exact same reaction. What are they doing to my Batman? And then I heard, I heard Kevin was involved as Bruce. And I'm like, all right, wait a minute now. And then I watched the, the pilot episode and then and the next one, and then the next yeah, one. Yeah, I was hooked. I was yeah, hooked. This yeah, is exactly. awesome. This is an awesome and, tale run, like how to pass that torch on to somebody yeah. else, a little futuristic, a little, you know, totally different. I loved it. Yep, and I would love to see a live action. I don't know. Yeah, definitely. I would love to see that. Again, Michael Keane coming back. Is exactly. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be great because I can see him hobbling around on a cane, you know. Oh uh, yeah, he might, he might not like that too much, you know, since he's the vulture now. Fair, but, fair. And, you know, <laughs> and these stuff into it. <laughs> and these days, there's no, uh, there's nothing keeping these actors for one studio or the other. You know, you see one on Marvel, you see mm -hmm. him play another character for DC or Warner Brothers, yep. and uh, so there's nothing saying Keaton can't come over and, and be uh, Batman again. So you hear us, DC? I know. <laughs> The heiress to the throne of the bat, the bat cave said. We need uh, there's it. been a lot of talk. A lot of people over there have said that they'd like to see him do that. But I mean, you never know. It, it right. I guess it takes the right director and script and all of that right. stuff to come in and, and appeal him to come back and play the character again. Right. So. Now, aside from grandfather's legacy tell the audience what it is you do you said you you went to art school um i did i went to pre, uh art school in high school for a little while um and then i i was steered off of that path i was going to go to art school for college but i ended up doing um life skills instead <laughs> i graduated from high school and decided to get a job and do some other things before i invest all that money into something that I didn't know if I was really going to be able to utilize whatever degree. So I got you. Your advice. <laughs> well, it's expensive. Well, it's, well, it's like that, that uh, commercial where, you know, the people are acting, they say you become your parents and the waitress says she's going to art school and the lady goes, so have you thought about how you're going to make money? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, geez. And my wife is a, an art major and an artist. And so I, you know, I, she's heard it all. But so yeah, I was just curious if you, if you'd stayed into art, do, do you still like to, to draw or? Well, I do. I got back into painting a couple years ago. So I, as I have, you can see I have a Star Wars piece that I did behind me. Oh. Um, so I, I have gotten back into it. I mean, I've always been creating. I mean, even if I was doing other things. I mean, I went back to college and got my degree in math so I could teach. I mean, I was, like, practical and said, okay, well, I'll teach then. <laughs> At least I'll have, like, time off and, and be able to do something that I enjoy. Because I enjoy teaching also. I mean, it's my other passion. So, um but like I said, I, I got back into serious painting uh, a couple years ago, and I've been doing that on and off. Uh, people have asked me to do some commission work, and I do my own stuff and try to fit it in with, you know, everything else. I mean, I have nothing but time right now. So. <laughs> right. Well, so is there any place, you know, any website or anything that you want to push? Is, um, is you can always find me. I, I do have my own website. Just put my name in athenafinger.com or you can find me on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram and you can just send me a message and, and we can talk about what you're looking for. So uh, I've done a lot of the golden age covers. I've done some interesting original stuff. Um, I just mm -hmm. finished a Rocky and Bullwinkle piece that people are like, hmm, because it's not, <laughs> It's not a cartoon Rocky and Bullwinkle. It's an actual real moose and a flying squirrel. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, but it's a play on it. And then you see um, right. the shadow of Boris and Natasha hidden behind a tree. So, I mean, it kind of like hints to, because I love Rocky and Bullwinkle. I mean, I grew up on that sure. stuff. So, um, you know, I just, I try to do a little bit of everything. I, I, I've done some fine art. I've done comic art. I've done everything in between. <laughs> Very cool. Very cool. Well, like I said, Athena, it, I, when we first got this going on, Meredith came to me and she said, uh, or no, it was before this was going on. She told me that she had been to a con and, and I met uh, someone with Batman's granddaughter. And I said, who? 
And she goes, let me, hang on, let me look. And I said, if you say something finger, I'm going to die. <laughs> and she goes, <laughs> yeah, Athena finger. And I was like, oh, my God, Meredith, are you kidding me? Uh, but, yeah, because, like I said, I, I knew about Bill many years ago. And as soon as I was going through Hulu and I saw Batman and Bill, I knew what it was about and without having heard anything about it. And so I watched it. And, of course, I watched it. When it, it had been a while now because it was when it first came out. So it's time to, to refresh myself and watch it again because it is such a great story. And, and like we said earlier, folks, if you haven't seen Batman and Bill, it is the story of Bill Finger, Athena's grandfather. He was the, the brains behind the Batman we know. I mean, we've seen Bob Kane's name all of our lives. And <laughs> Athena, yes. Oh, <laughs> <Thank that's true. laughs> you. But we, we would definitely loved having you athena please come back anytime you have something going on anytime yes. uh this was great thank you so much for having me well here let me let uh rob say hi he's been hi, waiting in the background at least i caught him with a shirt on this time the other day <laughs> man, it was scary. Well, come on, he's a sexy beast <laughs> you're muted hang on let me unmute you uh. I'm, times are tough i gotta make money anyway <laughs> <laughs> you know I know it's great seeing Athena. I hope you guys are safe. I hope everything's going well. This is we are. We're, we're, we're doing well. I hope you guys are doing well too over there. I, I can't run into Athena and talk to her anymore. It's it's horrible. We get to see Soon each other. Soon enough. Yeah. Soon enough. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yes. You Thank you, little man. Hi. <laughs> yeah. Here's the troublemaker. <laughs> See, I, I, yeah, I just wanted to, I called Matt a jerk because I'm like, I am not a comic book person at all. So it's like, you know, I, I said, yeah, I, I met uh, Rick Stafford, you know, he does the true Aquaman cosplay and stuff and, and Athena, Athena, Batman. And, and he goes, Athena finger. He's like, what the hell is wrong with you? <laughs> I'm like, I didn't know I was in, you know, in the presence of royalty. <laughs> You notice how I made them all stay in the at the background. They've been here the whole time. I just I wouldn't let them in. I, oh, I was yeah. like, you want to be all here, so. Yep, exactly. <laughs> and, and actually, we've got Rick Stafford that's coming on next, and you are yes. more than welcome to stay yes, during his please. time. Oh, okay. Unless he wants yeah, to boot you out. No. We're, we're just waiting for him. We're waiting in the queue, or we're waiting for him to pop in here. But it's yep. uh, yes, a few see. more minutes. Yeah, he's still got a couple of minutes. But uh, yeah. So I, um, actually, before before we go on, I wanted to do one more giveaway. Uh, we Whoa. have got a T-shirt from Enfuego Films. I don't have a, a graphic for it yet, but I wanted to give that away. So um, it is uh, Enfuego Films. They're going to be a guest with us uh, in a little bit. Let me see my schedule here. <laughs> Enfuego Entertainment is going to be here from 3.30 to 4. So they are going to, uh, you know, we're kind of teasing it with a, a T-shirt. And uh, so if you guys, if you are viewing and you want a T-shirt, leave a comment in uh, any of our platforms here and we're going to put your name in uh, in the randomizer and select for that and um, I'll get I'll give it back to you guys well Rob I was want to make sure did you have anything that uh, that we missed was there any tidbits that you know about Athena that that we didn't uh, cover here we well, guys didn't you talk guys. about how awesome an artist she is and show off yeah. her art. well I we didn't show off her I art I have her sketchbook at home. I, it's one of my cherished possessions. I have it with my collectible <laughs> stuff, so it's awesome. Um, one day I'm going to get her to do a cover from one of my kids' books. We I would love that. that. I actually did a cover for somebody down in um, Fort Lauderdale that has his own comic that he's been doing for the last several decades. So um, hopefully that will be printed soon, and I'll be able to share that with everyone, So, which was fun. I enjoyed that. Definitely something I'm looking forward to because of of course, uh, Athena was one of the first people I ever talked to about Cat Dad and Super Mom. She was someone we were talking about it with. So it's all, and it's funny we don't talk about this a lot, but we really miss running into our friends. And it's great to see her on air now and have a, just to sit in the back and just hear her voice and be around her again was super cool. Well, well, I, I know, know. I know I it's important so being able to connect with our con family, and and it's been kind of weird. Like usually, um like doing a zillion and one things. And I'm like, oh, well, I guess I have time to do like five more paintings. <laughs> yeah, and so I've got to ask the, the, the 
the real question here, does Athena have her I got spanked button? No, I, I, I'm not. Nope. <laughs> she's able to get she's able to get any book she wants from my table. She knows that. But no, I wouldn't even if she asked me, I'd be like, no. You I right? can't that. That's too intimidating. No, thank you. <laughs> hey now, what, is, what just, does that mean? I was just What's trying that to be intimidating. Don't tell me I'm intimidating you, Rob. No, Come no, on. but she, look at her boyfriend. Her boyfriend would kick my ass. And I don't say that often. He would he would take me down to the ocean and just beat me. Just beat me. No, I'm not doing that. No, thank you. I know I don't play and stay in it. <laughs> I got the exact oh, reaction out of Rob I was hoping for. I I was thought I knew the answer to that question, and I was thinking I could get him with that one, but uh, that was actually even better than I was expecting. Oh, uh, now, how long ago did you two guys meet? I take it you met at a con, right? We did. We met at a tiny little convention in Mount Dora. I went to a little post suit size convention. <laughs> And uh, he actually wasn't dressed as Aquaman, and I actually wasn't produced, you know, promoting Bill Finger's story. I was kind of promoting my artwork. So oh, cool. <laughs> neither one of us were like really talking about who we really were. So uh, I, we connected several months after that, and I, you know, kind of was like, hey, this is, you know, my connection to the comic world, and, you know. Went from there. He told me about how he got into cosplay and, and things like that. So, I mean, it was kind of, you know, in the cards for us to connect. It's been awesome ever since. So, so you know, I see all the collectibles back there, Athena. Um, are you spending more money at the cons than what you would bring in? You know, that was always my problem. Was Actually, all of that stuff is Rick's stuff. He used to be part of the 501st, so he has a lot of his old armor. Um, oh, gotcha. And um, a lot of this stuff is from when his son was still with us. Um, I'll let him talk about that. Um, <laughs> so I kind of share my studio slash office with his uh, collection of Star Wars stuff. I got gotcha. you. So, but I figured since the helmets were showing, I would showcase my Star Wars piece behind me. That I'm Certainly. Walking. I'm trying to like show it, but whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a big fan of the any Star Wars work, but uh, my wife did one, and it made me laugh and be uh, excited all at once. She did a new David and versus Goliath, but it was Baby Yoda versus Smog, uh -huh. and <laughs> and she just she did so well on the details of the scales, and Baby Yoda's just sitting there with his hand up and his little cup of coffee or soup or whatever it was, and I was like, that is just the coolest Star Wars thing I've seen in a long time. <laughs> well, this one is actually a cover that Carmine did. Um, Carmine and my grandfather were really good friends. And here, let me see if I can actually yeah. show you the piece here. Yeah. Um, it's really big, so it's kind of hard to see it. But uh, it's this cover here. Very cool. Um, if you and I have the original comic, and then the background for that one is originally pink. <laughs> it was pink. Oh yeah, um, it had like pink and like it was like a box, and it like kind of was like Starburst box looking. It's uh, bizarre, and I was like, I can't do that. That doesn't <laughs> look like space. So what? I changed the background completely to have like a space looking background, and then kept the original image. So I, love I, it. I did this one a few years ago. It's for sale if anybody wants it. <laughs> hey, there you go, guys. Hey, there's Amanda. Amanda King said hi, everybody. Amanda's a friend of mine. Hi, Amanda. Hi, Amanda. <laughs> I say a friend. She's like a really, really good friend. Let me find out where Rick is for you because he's late. Yeah, I, um, I was going to say, I'm about to chase him down on social media here. <laughs> But uh, in the meantime, I've got a uh, giveaway going. You guys need to leave a uh, comment if you're in the live audience because you have to attend in order to get any of these prizes. And, uh, you know, physical prizes. We've got some PDF uh, it, um, comic books. We've got, like, physical comic books. We've got a few other things that are really cool. We did a reveal. Yesterday. Was it yesterday, Matt? 
yep. I, all my yep. days are kind of mushing together. Running here. together. Tune in to find out more after this 30 second break. Hey guys, Matthew here with geekinsider.com. And I just wanted to give a quick shout out to one of our sponsors, mobileedge.com. If you're a gamer and looking for some gear to protect your gaming gear, Mobile Edge has gaming backpacks, they've got totes, they've got all kinds of carrying cases and tech for today's mobile lifestyle. Protect your tech with Mobile Edge. Look sharp, travel smart, Mobile Edge. Bring it on. We continue now with our special guest, Rick Stafford, the true Aquaman. Hey, hey! Look what who we have. Yay! Hey. <laughs> oh, can we hear? Yeah, we can hear. Yeah, you guys should be able to hear me pretty well. Yes. Uh, hey there. There hey. he is. <laughs> Where did Rob go? I guess he ran out. Or maybe he what, what's, what's going on here? Well, are you reading the comics? What, what's going on with the... <laughs> We got Aquaman. a little facial hair going on there. Yeah, Aquaman has a beard right now. If you read the comics, you know that. Oh. <laughs> oh. I told you, I'm not a comics girl. I am so out of here. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 you know, because I'm with him, okay? Like, I have no <laughs> idea what was going on with the character. <laughs> well, that, that was one of the things. When I read your bio, Athena, you were like, uh, you you were trying to tell people about Bill Finger and then, um, and people kind of rejected you and you stopped. And uh, so you weren't really in the comic scene at all. And then, you know, so now you are here with the true Aquaman who is like totally in the cosplay and comic scene. I know. And, uh, Did that happen? you know, <laughs> advocating for uh, Bill Finger and Batman and, and comics and you're going to all of these events. I mean, that must have been just kind of a crazy switch, you know? I mean, we all reach those points where we are, um, you know, where where we have these uh, kind of life-changing events and things like that, uh, you know? So it, it, it must have been really kind of interesting and going, was, how did I get on this? It was definitely out of my comfort zone. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. But you know what? The fans are awesome. They really are. They made me feel super comfortable, even though I was so uneducated about the genre and, and the character. And, you know, I learned so much from other people uh, about Batman and about my grandfather because I never met him. So I got to hear other people's stories that were in the industry or just people who knew him or, or even got a chance to work with him. So I, I really was embraced and I embraced being part of the culture. Uh, Rick, how did you get into to cosplay and, and, and going to the cons and eventually meeting Athena? Ooh, wow. You, you, were, you went right out of, oh, go ahead. Go yeah, ahead, I, I was going to say, uh, I was reading some of your bio and I, uh, you know, Tissues, grab some tissues. <laughs> That's all I have to uh -oh. say. Yeah, but, no, I mean, yeah, I, yeah, you, you know. hit the big question right out of the shoe. Oh, wait, wait a minute. That's yeah, I, and I'm going to. We're, we're <laughs> going to put that right out there because I mean that I think that really launched uh, launched you. And I'm sorry if that was a, a little giveaway, but I, I'm going to shut up and let you speak. Okay. Um, yeah, um, my cosplay world actually started in the Star Wars world, not the um, Aquaman world. Uh, in fact, if you look behind Athena, you'll see some helmets up on the shelf. And so, yeah, right? Oh, oh wrong one. Sorry. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, um, the helmet that you see in the middle, uh, the Episode 2 clone helmet that you see up there, uh, right above Yoda, um, that was actually my first official cosplay in the cosplay world and the the way that came about was um i want to say 16 years ago now um there was a young boy who had developed leukemia and uh, at, at the age of seven he um he was having a, a rough time of it and he started watching the star wars movies while in the hospital and then one night just out of blue said am i becoming a jedi you know so I was there with him, and uh, I lied to him, and I said, yes, this is what's happening. You're becoming a Jedi. You're not fighting cancer. You're becoming a Jedi. 
So I went out, bought him a Jedi costume, got him um, everything, the, the robe, the, uh, the FX sword, the one that lights up with the sound effects, and went about basically training him to be a Jedi. Uh, I went out and I bought a, a $1,000 Jedi master outfit, you know, $500 boots, the whole outfit, sword, started getting books on meditation, thoughtfulness, um, uh, Buddhist monks started studying the ways of the Buddhist monks because that's what George Lucas had used for the storyline of the Jedi. And so every time I would visit this, uh, this little boy named Christian, uh, I would teach him about the ways of the Force. Uh, we would do sword fighting practice because I would read books on sword fighting you know, for beginners. And, um, and everywhere he went, he would wear the Jedi robes and whatnot. Well, uh, about, uh, I want to say, nine, ten months later, he succumbed to the cancer. Uh, the leukemia took his life. And um, the next day, he went to the crematorium dressed as a Jedi. I went to the crematorium, had them bring his body out. I dressed him as a Jedi. So when he was cremated, he was cremated as a Jedi. And um, Man. then, um, yeah, this, uh, this young boy was my son. Um, and, and he passed away at the age of eight. And um, so I had, invited, I had invited a group called the 501st to be his honor guard. And so they showed up in force. And when you walked to the memorial service, you had to walk through a line of Jedis and, and stormtroopers. And then they, they made him officially a member of the 501st and the Rebel Legion. Uh, to my knowledge, he is still the only child who actually has an adult designation. Uh, and that would be TC1219, um, 1219, which is his birthday. And the TC designation is for clone trooper because he believes in the Jedi so much. His whole thing was about the Army of the Republic. Now, he passed away uh, three months prior to Revenge of the Sith, so he never saw the clones turn on the Jedi. So in his mind, they were still his, his people. And um, so after the ceremony was over, uh, at the wake following the, the ceremony, the 501st guys were there, and they made an announcement, and they said, you know, Rick, because of what you did for your son, we would love you to join our ranks. And they brought out this big box, and inside was a clone trooper costume, uh, or kit, not a whole costume, just a kit, uh, including that helmet that you saw earlier. And they said, you've got three months to complete that costume and meet us in Miami for the premiere of Revenge of the Sith. And so for the next three months, I learned everything I could about cosplay. Uh, learned, you know, I spent more time in Joanne's fabric than I ever thought I would as a male. Um, you know, I was learning how to do snaps and rivets and JV welds and how to paint and use Dremel tools. In fact, I burned out two Dremel tools in the process of learning all this. And um, it, was, it was an experience. And I completed the costume the day before um, the whole uh, ordeal uh, down in Miami. And so when I got to Miami, it was my very first public cosplay event. And um, so... Uh, that's how I that's how I officially got involved with cosplay. Wow. Um, <laughs> yeah, big question. Well, I two. told you, grab the tissues because I am like bawling over here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Way well, to go, Mayor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Mayor, we're going to have to talk about your position with this company after this one. Uh, you know. My bad, uh, no, my bad. No, uh, thanks so much for sharing that. Uh, yeah. That's... Uh, it was a touching story to begin with that you were going and visiting this kid. And then when you revealed that it was your son, um, that was, uh, yeah, I, I had, I have five kids. I've raised five kids and, uh, uh I just can't imagine the, that pain and then the honor of, of what these, these guys did and everything that, that you went through with that. Um, I can see how cosplay is definitely has a special place in your heart. Um, and, you know, I know that it has to be uh, kind of taken a lot away that the cons are, are closed right now. Um, you know, it, it is, but um, it actually drove me in a, in a direction later in my life. Um, I was doing charity visits to hospitals, clinics, um, did lots and lots of charity work for different organizations, everything from the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, cancer organizations, uh, back when Livestrong was still strong. Um, and, you know, so I've got, I don't know, 
dozens upon dozens upon dozens of different charity events that I've done over the past 15 years as a cosplayer. And eventually I decided to get into the medical field. Well, while I was in that, going into that field, and that field is actually occupational therapy, uh, which probably 80% of the people in the world have no idea what occupational therapy is, but I'll get into that in a minute. Um, one of the routes that we could take is geriatric or pediatric. Well, because of what I had gone through, I swore to myself I was going to avoid pediatrics at all costs because of the fear factor of having to deal with a child that may remind me of my son. So I get through the entire program, get my national license taken care of, and I go to work or try to go to work, and there's nothing available except pediatric. So I, you know, of course, you know, you got to work. So I bit the bullet, went into pediatrics. And I've had such an amazing experience with these kids um, because I'm such an imaginative person. I can work with children, whereas with geriatric, you're just kind of doing repetitious. And for those of you who don't know what occupational therapy is, I give people their lives back. So if you've had a stroke, if you've had a, a bad fall, if you're having any kind of issues in life, um, occupational therapists, their job is to give you the maximum independence of your life back. So that might include, you know, everything from learning how to get out of bed, brush your teeth, wash your face, cook yourself a meal, and be functional in society, all the way to how to balance your checkbook again after a head injury, or um, how to have interaction with other people. You may have lost social skills, and so I have to teach social skills. Well, now my my bread and butter, my day-to-day -day job is working with children with autism who are already developmentally delayed depending on where they are on the spectrum. And right. so I go about helping them maximize their independence in the real world. So, so that's my day-to-day -day job. And um, thankfully because of the pandemic's situational distancing and the loosening of requirements, I'm now able to do what we call telemedicine or telehealth. So right. I actually work with these children still, just like I normally would, but I go and work through um, internet. And uh, we work on drills, you know, flashcards. I, you know, I have a little whiteboard. And in fact, here's my little whiteboard, you know, and I'll work on things, you know, read this, or I'll give them a math question, or I'll give them a scenario and say, all right, describe what you see on this, you know, so I can work with them. Um, you know, I get little activity books and I, I hand deliver each one of them books like this and say, all right, you know, let's open it up to this page here. All right, now we're going to work on this little maze right here. So let me watch you do that. And um, so, Very I'm still, so I'm being an essential worker still, but I'm getting right. to work from home for the most part. Right. And, you know, a, a lot of folks are having to do that right now. They're having to try to, to morph their positions um, to a work at home model. And it doesn't always work for everyone. It doesn't. It doesn't, but I think when this is all said and done in about a year, and I'm sorry to say this is going to take about a year, uh, for all of those out there like going, well, I can't wait for June, I can't wait. No, if you're watching the actual medical experts out there, not the, not the media, but uh, Athena and I both, we watch medical professionals every day give their briefing, and this is going to be a 16 to 18 month ordeal, and uh, it's unfortunate, but after this is all said and done, I think about 30% of those positions out in the world that are still existing um, will become tele televised or um, mobile. Right. So, so it and, is. It's changing everybody's lives. And Rick, you you definitely got props, man, because I used to be a paramedic way back in the day. Oh, and, EMT, uh, EMT firefighter. Yeah. Yep. And I uh, and I was a firefighter as well, but. I had the exact opposite. I was doing it 24 seven. I did it as a full time job. Also did it as a volunteer in the little town I lived in. And my girls were really little at the time. And I had multiple incidents right in a row with children. I had a, two SIDS. I had a car accident with that she was uh, targeting with brain damage. Uh, they were just bam, 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 bam. And I kept seeing my own kids in those faces and not so much that, but when the parents would start to cry, then it started affecting me. And because I've learned that I'm very, I'm an empath. And mm -hmm. 
uh, very empathetic. And so and that was at that point that I was like, all right, I, I've got to find another <laughs> career here. I'm in the wrong one. Um, and, and well, I did the, I went from tough career, from tough career to tough career. Um, right out of high school, I worked for the defense department and um, for six years and uh, I fought the drug war. So I was on the front lines of the drug war. Um, from there, I got out of that and I went to work as a firefighter, professional firefighter for six years. Um, you know, I went to standard, went to MT and I was hired on. And while I was a firefighter, not only was I just the standard guy, I went to hazmat school. So I became a hazmat tech. I was oh, part of I was part of something in Volusia County, uh, short lived called um, the Shark Team or Special Hazards and Rescue Company. So we were a dedicated unit with our own pager that went out for every specialized emergency out there. So we were like the special forces of the fire service in uh, Volusia County. Yeah. Um, and then from there, retired from there after six years, went to work as a school teacher. And I was a school teacher. I taught middle school and high school um, history and uh, economics in American government. We'll be back right after this. Nothing says personality quite like your personal hairstyle. Blue Man is obsessed with creating hair healthy products that make you look good and feel great. Paraben and cruelty free, Blue Man products are made in the USA. Need volume or hold? No problem. Follow Blue Man Tips to unlock a look that's uniquely you. Visit BlueMan.com. That's B-L-U-M-A-A-N.com. So did you have a, a just a torture wish there early in life? Um, well, <laughs> if you look behind me here, uh, you can see all of this. You can see all of this stuff back oh, here. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I've got my, my two master's degree. I actually have two master's degrees. Um, I've got two associate's degrees, a bachelor's degree. Uh, this is me back here. Uh, let's see what I'm doing. Yeah, this is my certification becoming an aquanaut. I lived underwater for uh, several days uh, and trained. Um, you can see my Eagle Scout back behind there, uh, my Iron Man, um, some of the other things on the wall the other side. Anyway, and then everything else is in front of me. So. Um, yeah, Wait, a thing Iron of, Man, as in a triathlon Ironman. Yes, I've done uh, two fulls, uh, six halves. Goodness gracious! And yeah. you lived underwater, so you are indeed a true Aquaman. I am. I am. Uh, I actually did a swim around the island of Key West, a 13-mile swim competition, and uh, finished first place in four hours and 23 minutes. Wow! Wow! Okay. Uh, I now, thought that so I had a I had a quick question though. Yeah. Um, you know, with the being that you're a certified scuba master diver and everything, um, is is the COVID stuff affecting that? I mean, can you can you go out there because that that to me is about as self distancing as you can get from people. <laughs> if you if you are diving with a partner um, who you know to be clean uh, or or, mm -hmm. corona, or yeah corona free. Um, yeah, you could shore dive, but if you're going to go boat diving, you know, you're going to be in close proximity to the other divers. I mean, you guys literally sit butt cheek to butt cheek on the dive boat until you get to the location. So social distancing on dive boats might be problematic, but if you wanted to go scuba diving off a of beach, you know, have at it. Um, so yeah, there's no problem there. Uh, the fill station, that's medical grade air when they pump it into the tank. So you don't have to worry about the possibility of the air being, um, problematic. So, um, and that was another job that I had after I was done teaching it. I went to work for Disney World as a shark diver for 13 years. So I worked in the Living Seas uh, shark tank for 13 years. So, so, so yeah. I just thought I was a jack of all trades. Um, you know, you got, you're a jack of all trades and got the degrees to prove it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so, if if the the world does turn back on come June, are you guys going to go to MegaCon, or will you be sitting it out and kind of waiting to see what happens? Knowing what I know about this virus, uh, I would sit out Mega. Yeah, uh, that's just that's just. Happen. No, I don't see it. Happen. They're looking to extend it right now to uh, to the end of June anyway. The stay at home orders. And that's what everyone doesn't understand. There, people are under the impression that as soon as they lift this ban, that means you're immune now. Right. No, it's still there. It's, it's going to, we're going to have another wave. 
because when they open things up, people are going to go back out, commingle. It's still there. Those who haven't had it already will then get it. You'll have another batch of people in the hospital. Um, and they're already telling people, if you wind up on a ventilator, there's only a 20% chance of survival. From, so all these hospitals saying, oh, we've got ventilators. We got, well, that's great for 20% of people that wind up that bad off. And uh, unfortunately, people are going from light, uh, just a, a dry cough to deceased in 48 to 72 hours. That's yeah, what, it's, yeah, it's scary. It is, it is. And my wife and I actually just went through the biggest part of the scare. She had to be tested. Um, and I just keep giving her a hard time, leave it up to her to get enough of a respiratory infection in the middle of a pandemic. Um, and, she, well, this is flu season, or flu season and allergy season. So, right. A lot well, of that's, we thought it was allergies at first because she has she gets a flu shot every year. She doesn't get the flu, but she started running a ninety nine fever. She had this cough for several days, and she's real lethargic. And so she called her doctor. She has a lot of underlying health issues, and so she called. And what pissed me off, and I didn't want to turn this into a COVID thing, but I will real quick, was that. She had to call a nurse. The nurse screened her the night before. The next day, because she passed that step, the doctor called her. Then because she passed that step, a government scheduler called her. And then we had to go to a full-on scene out of a, 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 an apocalyptic movie where we had to go to a tent city, pass through the cops, show up against the, the window, because you can't roll down your window, show mm -hmm. your phone with the email confirmation and ID and they're all wearing their mask and it was just very it's, it's something out of a horror movie yeah it's like it something was. out of a horror movie and you know thankfully thank god the, the test came back but it took 48 hours for the test yeah, or, so you're, yeah you're chewing your nails waiting yeah and yeah. like I said my wife has had bypass surgery uh, she's had health issues her whole life so we were you know chomping at the bit wanting to know what the news is and then you hear about you know, these people that aren't even presenting uh, uh, symptoms and they're getting tested. And, you know, especially, you know, celebrities, sports figures. I saw, I forget who it was. I just saw it on Twitter last night where she was like, you should be pissed that I got tested and you didn't. And, you know, because my thing is, it's not only those that, you know, they didn't test me. Anybody in the house, my yeah. mother-in-law has, has bad health. We should have all been tested, mm -hmm. but no. They didn't test anyone, and but they can anybody. Um, uh, Chris Cuomo's whole entire family got tested, but none of them were presenting. I mean, it's just it's very lopsided here. And it is, you know, it is. And the whole thing was is that I was getting to is is that we don't know. Uh, nobody knows right now. There's not been enough time to pass, and so even you know the the June the first of June is just a little over a month and a half away. Would I? chance going out i probably would if it was just me in the house and i wasn't going to be around anybody else but being around <laughs> yeah being around you know fifty thousand people yeah exactly yeah and, no that you're just asking for trouble and exactly. and i and you know i've been in the cosplay world for 16 years and do i want to see a major con like this go i'm bummed that not it's not until july but even san diego comic-con i believe will be called at this point and um and those are major ones those are some of the big ones and well, Cali um, california just extended their stay at home order you know ahead of the curve and mm -hmm. and they've been lucky on on keeping a lot of their cases down somewhat but yeah well i make a joke about the fact that people in california um are social distancing people anyway you know they don't you know they don't shake hands they just do the mm, mm, kind of thing <laughs> Well, when all this came down, I said, hell, I've been practicing this for this for 20 years. I've worked from home forever, you know. <laughs> it's just another day at the office for me. <laughs> but uh, Meredith, where did you go, woman? I need you to take over for just a minute, please, ma'am. <laughs> Don't let take over. Don't be Meredith. <laughs> I'll be right back, guys. Was I summoned? Yes. First of all, Were your eyeballs swimming, Matt? <laughs> yes. Speak the devil's name and the devil appears. I'll be right back. <laughs> Sir, first of all, if you go fishing in any uh, in any water capacity, uh, the fish already automatically do social distancing anyway. They keep away. Yeah. <laughs> like, dude, <laughs> <you're fine. laughs> So I, so I was get... listening in the background. You think yeah. that it's really, uh, you think con season for 2020 is done? 
until the late fall at least. And even then, I think it's it's going to be a whole different animal. Um, I think if anything, I think people who are cosplayer are going to start coming up with characters that require masks just for the sake of being able to protect themselves. And with due respect to people who cosplay, it goes to conventions for some. Not everybody practices great hygiene when they're no, going to do uh, a don't. convention. Yeah, in fact, I do a whole panel called Fitness Geekery, and we have a whole yeah. subsection of that panel on the fact about I, hygiene. I should not smell you before you come to my booth. No. <laughs> <laughs> That's the social distancing that I would like to have trained. But, uh, no, no, well, let, rephrase that. You should not offend me before you get to my booth. Well, well de define <laughs> yeah. offend by that point in our conversation. Because <laughs> we can never. I mean, if you, right, I mean, if that, you smell that, okay, if you lot. smell nice. <laughs> Well, there's some people that smell nice. You don't. Yeah. It's like, yeah. Hey, come on over here. I like the way you smell. Like COVID nineteen, you better smell like roses. Trust yeah. me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I, I'm well, gonna I say it's probably gonna be that Rob was saying earlier. That uh, you know, like uh, convention crud, is that what you call it? Yeah, yeah. Con crud, con crud. crud, yeah, for sure. Con crud. <laughs> yeah, con crud is a real thing that people struggle with. Yeah, I think it's going to be uh, open season for anybody who carries a free hug sign. Um, I do. I I give out hugs. Yeah. yeah, but the guys who carry around the free hug signs are usually the people who offend the most body okay. wise. <laughs> I don't carry it around. I keep it there, and I'll give up the hugs to just do spanks all year for social distancing. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Social and you'll, distancing. Uh, yeah, yeah. You'll just spritz down the the paddle between. My <laughs> hand will get the, the lotion first. <laughs> It'll rub the lotion on, and then the hand will. Be used. Here's the funny part. When I'm going to conventions, this has actually been preordained. Um, when the traveling TARDIS goes back to conventions, it will have a bottle of sanitizer and a thing of hand wipes. For every person who takes a picture with it right now, I'm just like, I would have never have done this, never have well, thought. Well, what this. you do is you drill out the bottom and you put a, a roll of those Lysol wipes in there, and you know, they pull out from the bottom. <laughs> Don't tempt me. <laughs> I've done weirder things with it. So. Things so, that I can Rick, say on the tell show us, uh, because. I, I did the I did a little bit of reading. You have how many cosplay costumes? Uh, Forty plus. Wow! And over how many? Uh, what time period did you accumulate or start making all of these? Um, well, I've been in the cosplay world for sixteen years. I've got a lot of Star Wars costumes from the get go. Uh, three different clone troopers. I've got a Grand Admiral. I've got a a Jedi costume. I've got. Um, Ooh, what all do I have in Star Wars? Well, I have a lot. Um, I had one stolen from me, which was very sad. It was um, the Royal Guard, the Red Guard. Yeah, that was actually stolen from me. And this, the helmet, I actually performed on stage with Weird, with Weird Al Yankovic with that cosplay, and he actually signed the inside of the helmet. So it was kind of sad to see that get taken. Um, but, yeah, so a lot of my initial ones were Star Wars related, and um, from there – I started moving into some video games, so Assassin's Creed, um, Resident Fallout. Evil, Fallout. Yeah, well, Fallout was recent, but um, but I went from Star Wars to Star uh, to video game, and then from video game I got into superheroes because we started doing charity work again, um, but not with the Five Hundred First and Rebel Legion, but now as a, a superhero. So my official, my first one was actually Angel from the X Men. I have uh, an eight hundred an eight hundred dollar pair of wings uh, that are made out wow. of actual turkey quill, and well, actually, they're made out of an airfoil. So if you in a wind, these wings actually lift, and um, and wow. yeah, I still have those. They're really cool. But unfortunately, the costume that I wore was the motorcycle costume from the movies, and not the X Men from the comics. So I would have to rework the rig on it because it's so heavy that I could wear the spandex over it and not see all the mechanics of it. Because what would happen is there's a panel in the back that when I arch my back makes the wings actually flap while I'm walking around. So oh, pretty, wow. Yeah. Um, and then from there I went to uh, Iron have Man. You, have you retired, any have you retired um, any of them? Like they're just kind of going to be in the closet or on display somewhere? Or? <laughs> um, well, not on display only because I don't have the room for display purposes, but I do have a wardrobe that actually just, it held a whole lot of the older ones. Um, 
like um, like that the, the uh, Angel Coffin has been kind of retired because I, I'd have to revamp it. Uh, my Iron Man, I've retired my Iron Man. That's an 85 pound costume. Um, that, wow. Yeah, it's an impressive costume, but it just it's not practical to wear. It takes over half an hour just to put it on. And um, and because of the weight and the way it wears, I can only wear it for a short time. And in a major convention setting, it's just too difficult to get out of there in a hurry if I need to. Um, mm -hmm. Let's see, superhero wise. Um, yeah, I've got just James Bond. Um, I think about all the different ones I've got. Uh, several different movie ones I've got out there. Oh, shoot, Athena probably could tell you more than I can think of. Oh, are Aquaman. He has like 10 different Aquaman outfits. Actually, 12. I have 12 versions well, of Aquaman. I lost yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 12 variations on Aquaman alone. And not one of them. The thing is just ticked well, off. We're getting towards the uh, uh, walk-in closet anymore. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's all taken yeah, like up. Who, by who has the largest walk-in closet, so right? Oh, I do. I, it's, it's a man cave. It literally yeah, is a man it's, cave. Yeah. It has, it has a library in it. That's how big my closet is. Wow. It, it has its own library. <laughs> well, we've got about five more minutes, so I want you guys to just, you know, um, let us know where our uh, listeners and followers can follow you guys and, you know, help grow your social media. Uh, I'm going to let Matt pop back in the seat, and I'm going to get ready for the uh, the next session here. Thank you guys for being part of um, Geek Out uh, Virtual Con. We really appreciate it. We're going to follow up with you guys later. Okay. So, I'm, Athena, I'll let you start. Um, I, I stated earlier, I do have a website, just my name, www.athenafinger.com, or you can find me on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram. Just put my name in, and you'll find me. So, Fantastic. And how about you, Rick? Uh, let's see. On Instagram, I'm the true Aquaman. On uh, Twitter, unfortunately, it was already taken, so I, I'm the king Aquaman on Twitter. And uh, on Facebook, you can find me under my actual name, Rick Stafford, or um, because unfortunately the True Aquaman page that I had, um, Facebook, something happened with Facebook and it deleted the entire page after many years. Yeah. Whoa. Yeah. Out of That's nowhere. Good. Yeah. It was just bizarre. It wasn't a hack or anything. It just, one day it was there, the next day it was gone. And uh, so we're still trying to figure out what happened with that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so uh, Instagram, the True Aquaman, Twitter, the King Aquaman, and on Facebook, you can find me under my name, Rick Stafford. Fantastic. Well, thank you both so much for joining, Rick. Thanks for sharing your story, Athena. My pleasure. You know, you're always welcome, ma'am. The 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 heiress to the Bat Cave. Uh, like I said, <laughs> you, <laughs> you were. You were uh, uh, the, the guest that, and I, you know, I can uh, make other people upset or whatever, but you were the guest I was most looking forward to. Oh, thank and, you. Okay. Yeah, and so I, I really appreciate y'all coming. And uh, anytime, that, like I was telling Athena earlier, anytime you guys are going to, once the world turns back on, if y'all got a place that you're showing up, you got something new that you're pushing, uh, anything, just give drop us a line at Matthew or Meredith at geekinsider.com. We'd love to hear from you. Oh, awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. you. Bet. Thank you all so much. Y'all take care. Stay safe and healthy, okay? You too. <laughs> Rick uh, continues his cosplay. He's going to take over the back cave. I'm probably. <laughs> I well, be no, next. Well, no, actually, in that uh, real quick yeah, teaser, I am looking to do a uh, 1939 Bill Finger Batman. Oh. Yeah. Oh, yeah. nice. All yeah. Right. Well, then yeah, maybe we'll be able to. <laughs> maybe we'll be able to see that Space Coast Con next year. And, yeah, uh, yeah. Maybe, and maybe even and maybe even an Alan Scott uh, Green Lantern, which is also Bill Finger's creation. Right, right. Very cool, man. Uh, now you got it. Now you got me uh, chomping at the bit for next next year because I already told Meredith if everything goes right, I'm flying in for next year. So. There you go. There awesome. you go. All right. Well, thank you so much. We're going to get ready for the next link. And uh, All right, guys. see you guys soon. Thanks so much. It's, been, it's a pleasure. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks, Athena. Thank you for tuning in to Geek Out Virtual Con, our two-day live streaming event, April 11th through 12th, 2020, with our special guests, Athena Finger, heiress to the Dark Knight, and Rick Stafford, the true Aquaman. But wait, we've got more panels and special guests. Be sure to subscribe 
to the Geek Insider Podcast, available on iTunes, Spotify, and we're now on iHeartRadio. And if you're watching on YouTube, hit the subscribe button and tell your friends, because if you don't, you might have to turn in your geek card. <laughs>